Autoeroticism, a study of the spontaneous manifestations of the sexual impulse, part three, section three of studies in the psychology of sex, volume one, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. Kuzmarski, John Thomas Coos. Autoeroticism. A Study of the Spontaneous Manifestations of the Sexual Impulse, Part 3, Section 3. In many cases, it has seemed to me that masturbation, when practiced in excess, especially if begun before the age of puberty, leads to inaptitude for coitus, as well as to indifference to it, and sometimes to undue sexual irritability, involving premature emission and practical impotence. This is, however, the exception, especially if the practice has not been begun until after puberty in women i attach considerable importance as a result of masturbation to an aversion for normal coitus in later life in such cases some peripheral irritation or abnormal mental stimulus trains the physical sexual orgasm to respond to an appeal which has nothing whatever to do with the fascination normally exerted by the opposite its sex at puberty however the claim of passion and the real charm of sex begin to make themselves felt but owing to the physical sexual feelings having been trained into a foreign channel these new and more normal sex associations remain of a purely ideal and emotional character without the strong sensual impulses with which under healthy conditions they tend to be more and more associated as puberty passes on into adolescence or mature adult life i am fairly certain that in many women often highly intellectual women the precocious excess in masturbation has been a main cause not necessarily the sole efficient cause in producing a divorce in later life between the physical sensuous impulses and the ideal emotions the sensuous impulse having been evolved and perverted before the manifestation of the higher emotion the two groups of feelings have become divorced for the whole of life this is a common source of much personal misery and family unhappiness though at the same time the clash of contending impulses may lead to a high development of moral character when early masturbation is a factor in producing sexual inversion it usually operates in the manner i have here indicated the repulsion for normal coitus helping to furnish a soil on which the inverted impulse may develop unimpeded this point has not wholly escaped previous observers though they do not seem to have noted its psychological mechanism Tissot stated that masturbation causes an aversion to marriage. More recently, Leumann, Uber Onanismus, Beim Weib, Therapeutisch Monatschrift, April 1890, considered that masturbation in women leading to a perversion of sexual feeling, including inability to find satisfaction in coitus, affects the associated centers. Smith Baker, again, the neuropsychical element in conjugal aversion, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, September 1892, finds that a source of marital aversion seems to lie in the fact that substitution of mechanical and iniquitous excitations affords more thorough satisfaction than the mutual legitimate ones do, and gives cases in point. Saville, also, who believes that masturbation is more common in women than is usually supposed, regards dyspareunia, or pair in coition, as one of the signs of the habit. Masturbation in women thus becomes, as Raymond and Janet point out, Les Obsessions, volume 2, page 307, a frequent cause of sexual frigidity in marriage. 
These authors illustrate the train of evils which may thus be set up. By the case of a lady, 26 years of age, a normal woman of healthy family, who at the age of 15 was taught by a servant to masturbate. At the age of 18 she married, she loved her husband, but she had no sexual feelings in coitus, and she continued to masturbate, sometimes several times a day, without evil consequences. At 24 she had to go into a hospital for floating kidney, and was so obliged to stop masturbating. She here accidentally learnt of the evil results attributed to the habit. She resolved not to do it again, and she kept her resolution. But while still in hospital, she fell wildly in love with a man. To escape from the constant thought of this man, she sought relations with her husband, and at times masturbated. But now it no longer gave her pleasure. She wished to give up sexual things altogether, but that was easier said than done. She became subject to nervous crises, often brought on by the sight of a man, and accompanied by sexual excitement. They disappeared under treatment, and she thereupon became entirely frigid sexually. But far from being happy, she has lost all energy and interest in life, and it is her sole desire to attain the sexual feelings she has lost. Adler considers that even when masturbation in women becomes an overmastering passion, so far as organic effects are concerned, it is usually harmless, its effects being primarily psychic, and he attaches especial significance to it as a cause of sexual anesthesia in normal coitus being perhaps the most frequent cause of anesthesia he devotes an important chapter to this matter and brings forward numerous cases in illustration adler die mengelhaft geschlecht semp feindung des vibes page ninety three two one nineteen also twenty one to twenty three adler considers that the frequency of masturbation in women is largely due to the fact that women experience greater difficulties than men in obtaining sexual satisfaction, and so are impelled by unsatisfying coitus to continue masturbating after marriage. He adds that partly from natural shyness, partly from shame of acknowledging what is commonly accounted a sin, and partly from the fear of seeming disgusting or unwanting of sympathy in the doctor's eyes, women are usually silent in this matter, and very great tact and patience may be necessary before a confession is obtained. On the psychic side, no doubt, the most frequent and the most characteristic result of persistent and excessive masturbation is a morbid heightening of self-consciousness without any coordinated heightening of self-esteem. The man or woman who is kissed by a desirable and desired person of the opposite sex feels a satisfying sense of pride and elation which must always be absent from the manifestations of auto-erotic activity. This must be so, even apart from the masturbator's consciousness of the general social attitude toward his practices and his dread of detection, for that may also exist as regards normal coitus without any corresponding psychic effects. The masturbator, if his practice is habitual, is thus compelled to cultivate an artificial consciousness of self-esteem, and may show a tendency to mental arrogance. Self-righteousness and religiosity constitute, as it were, a protection against the tendency to remorse. A morbid mental soil is, of course, required for the full development of these characteristics. The habitual male masturbator, it must be remembered, is often a shy and solitary person. Individuals of this temperament are especially predisposed to excesses in all the manifestations of autoeroticism, while the yielding to such tendencies increases the reserve and the horror of society at the same time producing a certain suspicion of others. In some extreme cases there is, no doubt, as Krepelin believes, some decrease of psychic capacity, an ability to grasp and coordinate external impressions, weakness of memory, deadening of emotions, or else the general phenomena of increased irritability, leading on to neurasthenia. 
I find good reason to believe that in many cases the psychic influence of masturbation on women is different from its effect on men, as Spitzka observed, although it may sometimes render women self-reproachful and hesitant, it often seems to make them bold. Boys, as we have seen, early assimilate the tradition that self-abuse is unmanly and injurious, but girls have seldom any corresponding tradition that is unwomanly, and thus, whether or not they are reticent on the matter, before the forum of their own conscience, they are often less ashamed of it than men are, and less troubled by remorse. Eulenberg considers that the comparative absence of bad effects from masturbation in girls is largely due to the fact that, unlike boys, they are not terrorized by exaggerated warnings and quack literature concerning the awful results of the practice. Forel, who has also remarked that women are often comparatively little troubled by qualms of conscience after masturbation, denies that this is due to a lower moral tone than men possess. Forel, Die Sexuelle Frage, page 247. In this connection, I may refer to History 4, recorded in the appendix to the fifth volume of these studies, in which it is stated that of fifty-five prostitutes of various nationalities, with whom the subject had had relations, eighteen spontaneously told him that they were habitual masturbators, while of twenty-six normal women, thirteen made the same confession, unasked. Gutsit in Russia, after stating that women of good constitution had told him that they masturbated as much as six or ten times a night until they fell asleep, tired, without bad results, adds that, according to his observations, masturbation, when not excessive, is, on the whole, a quite innocent matter, which exerts little or no permanent effect, and adds that it never, in any case, leads to hypochondria onanica in women, because they have not been taught to expect bad results. Dressing Jar Praxis, page 306. There is, I think, some truth, though the exceptions are doubtless, Many in the distinction drawn by W. C. Krauss, Masturbational Neuroses, Medical News, July 13, 1901. From my experience, it masturbation seems to have an opposite effect upon the two sexes, dulling the mental and making clumsy the physical exertions of the male, while in the female it quickens and excites the physical and psychical movements. The man is rendered hypoesthetic the woman hyperesthetic in either sex autoerotic excesses during adolescence in young men and women of intelligence whatever absence of gross injury there may be still often produce a certain degree of psychic perversion and tend to foster false and high-strung ideals of life Krapelin refers to the frequency of exalted enthusiasms in masturbators, and I have already quoted Anstey's remarks on the connection between masturbation and premature false work in literature and art. It may be added that excess in masturbation has often occurred in men and women whose work in literature and art cannot be described as premature and false. K. P. Moritz, in early adult life, gave himself up to excess in masturbation, and up to the age of thirty had no relations with women. Lenau is said, though the statement is sometimes denied, to have been a masturbator from early life, the habit profoundly affecting his life and work. Rousseau, in his Confessions, admirably describes how his own solitary, timid, and imaginative life found its chief sexual satisfaction in masturbation. Gogol, the great Russian novelist, masturbated to excess, and it has been suggested that the dreamy melancholy thus induced was a factor in his success as a novelist. Goethe, it has been asserted, at one time masturbated to excess. I am not certain on what authority the statement is made, probably on a passage in the seventh book of Dichtung und Wahrheit, in which describing his student life at Leipzig, and his loss of Anetchen, owing to his neglect of her, he tells how he revenged that neglect on his own physical nature, 
by foolish practices from which he thinks he suffered for a considerable period the great scandinavian philosopher soren kierkegaard suffered severely according to rasmussen from excessive masturbation that at the present day eminence in art literature and other fields may be combined with the excessive practice of masturbation is a fact of which i have unquestionable evidence i have the detailed history of a man of thirty of high ability in a scientific direction who except during periods of mental strain has practiced masturbation nightly though seldom more than once a night from early childhood without any traceable evil results so far as his general health and energy are concerned in another case a school teacher aged thirty a hard worker and accomplished musician has masturbated every night sometimes more than once a night ever since he was at school without so far as he knows any bad results he has never had connection with a woman and seldom touches wine or tobacco Kirschman knew a young and able author who from the age of eleven had masturbated excessively but who retained physical and mental freshness it would be very easy to refer to other examples and i may remark that as regards the histories recorded in various volumes of these studies a notable proportion of those in which excessive masturbation is admitted are of persons of eminent and recognized ability it is often possible to trace the precise mechanism of the relationship between autoerotic excitement and intellectual activity. Brown Sequard, in old age, considered that to induce a certain amount of sexual excitement, not proceeding to a mission, was an aid to mental work. Raymond and Janet knew a man considering himself a poet who, in order to attain the excitation necessary to compose his ideal verses, would write with one hand while with the other he caressed his penis, though not to the extent of producing ejaculation. We must not believe, however, that this is by any means the method of workers who deserve to be accepted seriously it would be felt to say the least as unworthy it is indeed a method that would only appeal to a person of feeble or failing mental power what more usually happens is that the autoerotic excitement develops pari passu and spontaneously with the mental activity and at the climax of the latter the autoerotic excitement also culminates almost or even quite spontaneously in an explosion of detumescence which relieves the mental tension i am acquainted with such cases in both young men and women of intellectual ability and they probably occur much more frequently than we usually suspect in illustration of the foregoing observations i may quote the following narrative written by a man of letters from puberty to the age of thirty i lived in virgin continence in accord with my principal during these years i worked exceedingly hard chiefly at art music and poetry my days being spent earning my livelihood these art studies fell into my evening time i noticed that productive power came in periods periods of irregular length and which certainly to a partial extent could be controlled by the will such a period of vital power began usually with a sensation of melancholy and it quickened my normal revolt against the narrowness of conventional life into a red-hot detestation of the paltriness and pettiness with which so many mortals seem to content themselves as the mood grew in intensity the scorn of the lower things mixed with and gave place to a vivid insight into higher truths the oppression began to give place to a realization of the eternity of the heroic things the fatuities were seen as mere fashions love was seen as the true lord of life the eternal romance was evident in its glory the naked strength and beauty of men were known despite their clothes in such mood my work was produced bitter protest and keen-sighted passion mingled in its building 
the arising vitality had certainly deep relation to the periodicity of the sex force of manhood at the height of the power of the art creative mood would come those natural emissions with which nature calmly disposes of the unused force of the male such emissions were natural and healthy and not exhaustive or hysterical the process is undoubtedly sane and protective unless the subject be unhealthy the period of creative art power extended a little beyond the end of the period of natural seed emission the artwork of this last stage being less vibrant and of a gentler force then followed a time of calm natural rest which gradually led up to the next sequence of melancholy and power the periods certainly varied in length of time controlled somewhat by the force of the mind and the mental will to create that is to say i could somewhat delay the natural mission by which i gained an extension of the period of power how far masturbation in moderately healthy persons living without normal sexual relationships may be considered normal is a difficult question only to be decided with reference to individual cases as a general rule when only practiced at rare intervals and faute de mieux in order to obtain relief for physical oppression and mental obsession it may be regarded as the often inevitable result of the unnatural circumstances of our civilized social life when as often happens in mental degeneracy and as in shy and imaginative persons perhaps of neurotic temperament may also sometimes be the case it is practiced in preference to sexual relationships it at once becomes abnormal and may possibly lead to a variety of harmful results mental and physical it must always be remembered however that while the practice of masturbation may be harmful in its consequences it is also in the absence of normal sexual relationships frequently not without good results in the medical literature of the last hundred years a number of cases have been incidentally recorded in which the patients found masturbation beneficial and such cases might certainly have been enormously increased if there had been any open-eyed desire to discover them my own observations agree with those of suddeth who asserts that masturbation is in the main practice for its sedative effect on the nervous system the relaxation that follows the act constitutes its real attraction both masturbation and sexual intercourse should be classified as typical sedatives gall functions du cerveau eighteen twenty five volume three page two thirty five mentioned a woman who was tormented by strong sexual desire which she satisfied by masturbation ten or twelve times a day this caused no bad results and led to the immediate disappearance of a severe pain in the back of the neck from which she often suffered clauston mental diseases eighteen eighty seven page four ninety six quotes as follows from a letter written by a youth of twenty-two i am sure i cannot explain myself nor give account of such conduct sometimes i feel so uneasy at my work that i would go to the water-closet to do it and it seemed to give me ease and then i would work like a hatter for a whole week till the sensation overpowered me again i have been the most filthy scoundrel in existence etc garnier presents the case of a monk aged thirty-three living a chaste life who wrote the following account of his experiences for the past three years at least i have felt every two or three weeks a kind of fatigue in the penis or rather slight shooting pains increasing during several days and then i feel a strong desire to expel the semen when no nocturnal pollution follows the retention of the semen causes general disturbance headache and sleeplessness 
I must confess that, occasionally to free myself from the general and local oppression, I lie on my stomach and obtain ejaculation. I am at once relieved. A weight seems to be lifted from my chest, and sleep returns. This patient consulted Garnier as to whether this artificial relief was not more dangerous than the sufferings it relieved. Garnier advised that if the ordinary regime of a well-ordered monastery, together with an aphrodisiac sedatives, proved inefficacious, the maneuver might be continued when necessary. P. Garnier, Celibat et Celibataires, 1887, page 320. H. C. Co., American Journal of Obstetrics, page 766, July 1889, gives the case of a married lady who was deeply sensitive of the wrong nature of masturbation, but found in it the only means of relieving the severe ovarian pain associated with intense sexual excitement, which attended menstruation. During the intermenstrual period, the temptation was absent. Turnbull knew a youth who found that masturbation gave great relief to feelings of heaviness and confusion which came on him periodically, and Wigglesworth has frequently seen masturbation after epileptic fits in patients who never masturbated at other times. Mole Libido Sexualis, B.D. 1, page 13 refers to a woman of twenty-eight, an artist of nervous and excitable temperament, who could not find sexual satisfaction with her lover, but only when masturbating, which she did once or twice a day, or oftener. Without masturbation, she said, she would be in a much more nervous state. A friend tells me of a married lady of forty, separated from her husband on account of incompatibility, who suffered from irregular menstruation. She tried masturbation, and in her own words, became normal again. She had never masturbated previously. I have also been informed of the case of a young, unmarried woman, intellectual, athletic, and well-developed, who, from the age of seven or eight, has masturbated nearly every night before going to sleep, and would be restless and unable to sleep if she did not. End of Autoeroticism Part 3, Section 3 Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski www.johncoos.com